to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group. Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello there and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, where we bring you all the stories that matter on the show tonight. Record ratings, soaring profits, and prize money worth millions. With just an hour to go until team dance sensation Luke Littler takes a shot at becoming world champion, we're going to take a look at the unstoppable business of darts. Reform leader Richard Tice attacks Labour and Conservatives in his pitch to the nation, but with the group posing the biggest threat to the Tories, could they be the ones to trigger a Labour landslide? And also tonight, could deadly blasts in Iran spark wider fallout in the Middle East? Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with journalist and commentator Andrew Connolly and assistant US opinion editor of The Telegraph, Bobby Coburn. This is Primetime. Oh, welcome back. It's good to be back with you. It may be his first world tournament, but Luke Littler looks like he was born to be there. Luke Littler by name, but right now arguably the biggest name in world darts. Takes the youngest the player to reach the final of the darts championships, he's the sport's newest superstar, preparing for this moment since he was able to walk. No wonder he's already a showman on stage and the crowd loves him too. At just 16 years old, he's only played four senior matches like this before. Now he's smashing through each round, wiping the floor with former world champions as he storms towards tonight's final, where world number three Luke Humphreys is the only thing standing in the way of him and half a million pounds in prize money. So, is he nervous? Just the same, same routine. Dinner, come here, have some, have some tea. Um, on the board, just don't change anything. Just trying to, trying to think if I could even lift a trophy. Is it heavy? <laughs> but no, I'm just, I just, I can't, can't believe I'm still here. It's just, it's crazy to think I'm in a World Championship final. The amount of finals I've watched, and now I'm into one. But it's not just Luke Littler's popularity that's exploding. Darts is as well. The teenage sensation's head-to-head -head semi-final last night broke TV records. Reeling in an audience of more than 2.3 million people. That is bigger than the Ashes and the Ryder Cup. Now, the transformation of darts from pub pastime to global spectator sport has been something of a marketing masterclass and one that is worth massive money. The UK-based company behind tournaments like this one, the Professional Darts Corporation, has increased its annual profits, get this, over the last decade from £1.9 million in 2013 to £12.3 million pounds today. As for winnings, the first tournament in 1994 saw the victor take home just £16,000. Now it's £500,000, and by next year, it's likely to be even more. So how have they managed all this, especially fending off accusations that it's only a pub game and not a proper sport? Well, is it the skill, the characters, the infamous rivalries? Because playing to 90,000 people who are drinking half a million pints between them over two and a half weeks, there's always going to be some activity, isn't there? Certainly, much of the success has been credited to promoter Barry Hearn, who saw it as an opportunity to throw the festive party of all parties. At this time of year, if you go anywhere near Alexandra Palace outside London, you'll be unlikely to avoid scores of grown men dressed as everything from Ali G to Princess Peach and chanting stand up if you love the darts. Well, tonight we look at how the humble game of darts has become the ultimate British winter sporting spectacle. Let us head out there then and speak to some people who are in the know about this. First of all, speaking to Harry Durham, who's joining us from a kebab van outside Alexandra Palace. Um, tell us why. Tell us why you're holding a kebab, Harry. Oh, God. Why am I holding a kebab? Because this is what Luke Littler eats every time. After every game, he treats himself to a kebab. Lads, let's sing Luke a little song, shall we? There's only one Luke Littler. One Luke Littler. Walk it along. Sing a song. Walk it along. So, as you can see behind me, there is a free kebab van. 
selling free oh, kebabs from TalkSport. Free kebab, Luke the Luke, the biggest fight of his life tonight, 16 years old, and in the PDC World Darts Championship, it is going to go off. Mr. Crocodile, my friend, How are we? the biggest night of Luke Littler's life. Who have, you, who have you got as your winner? For me, Luke Littler. I reckon Humphreys takes a nine daughter and Littler goes on to win it. What's been his secret, though? Because we've seen two world champions fold under Luke Littler. Is he getting in their head? He's got to be. He's got to be. What else can it be? Is he very talented at darts or is he getting in their heads? When you talk about like, the greatest sporting feats of all time, Ronnie O'Sullivan, 17 years old, when he won the Snooker yeah. World Championships, Tiger Woods, 21, when he won the Masters, yeah. would this be <laughs> top of the lot in this terms of sporting achievements? It's got to be, on it? It's got to be. Do you it's reckon so? Great, great sport of an so? achievement of all time, by any young person, ever, hands down. Doesn't phase him, he's going to win tonight. Lads, Good are we night. getting a kebab or not? Of course we are. Oh. Hey, we'll, wait, we'll do it afterwards when he wins, yeah, of course. <laughs> Let me just shout out one person, cheers. <laughs> Charlie McCurdy. Person there we go. <laughs> Ali Pally. It is ready. The fans are ready. Everyone is ready to go. It's going to be a special night here the at the Palace. The parrot coming in there with some key analysis, uh, you know, to add uh, to what we already got. Look, Harry, before we Cutting let you go... start analysis, what can I say? What can you say? It's pitch side analysis over there with free kebabs from Talk Sport. What more do you want? Look, Harry, whilst, <laughs> whilst we've got you, I just want to ask you, in your time as a sports journalist, did you ever think you'd see darts get to this? Um, darts has always been really big in my household. I always used to play darts with friends down the pub. I still do. But I have never seen, in all of my 27 years, you're probably shook that I'm saying that I'm 27 and look about 35. I have never seen a sportsman or a sports child in that regard, or in that respect, galvanise a whole country. This is taking darts to a completely different level. Darts has never really sort of broken the USA. But now Luke Littler is on the scene. This kid's changing the game. You, and just, you, you already mentioned some key young sports people there that have done some incredible things. The one that springs to mind for me is Emma Raducanu, somebody who just came in as a teenager and just took the title. Uh, do you think Littler could do it? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Sorry. Do you reckon you Littler, Littler could really take the title at 16 years old? What would that mean for darts? It would be incredible. It's just proof that anyone could sort of do it. It's going to bring a whole new... It's going to bring a whole new fan base in, let's be honest. Kids are going to see this. Kids see footballers. They will see, say, for example, Sergio Aguero when he was playing at Manchester City, David Beckham when he was at Manchester United, kicking a ball about. People are going to be asking for dartboards for Christmas. Five-year-olds are going to be wanting dartboards for Christmas. It's absolutely sensational. I can't really believe that I'm here speaking to you right now about a 16-year-old in the World Championships. It just doesn't make sense, but it's happening. Harry, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for making time for us. Um, we'll let you get back to the kebab and the fans. I have missed this show. <laughs> My goodness, what, what a welcome back. <laughs> Meanwhile, Talk TV's Nick Ellaby has spent the afternoon at the Darts Academy in Sutton Leach, where the teenager has honed his craft. Safe to say they'll be watching with bated breath tonight. He sent, sent this report just moments ago. Good evening, Rosanna. If you haven't got tickets for the Ali Pali tonight, then this is the place to be. St. Helens Darts Academy, where Luke Littler, still only 16, remember, honed his skills as a young darter. And I'm also I'm joined by some of the young players here uh, who, you know, part of, part of Luke's, Luke's Academy. Guys, give me your darts name. Um, the Arrow, Jack Flash, Dan the Man, the Princess. Okay, you got Rob the Arrow. Jack Flash, Dan the Man, and the Princess. Guys, what, what songs are they singing about Luke at the moment? Wasn't it? What was it? Something about school? You've got, you've got school in the morning, school, school in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, so they don't have school until next week, these guys, but thank you, everyone. They, uh, Luke, you know, Luke, just fresh out of school and at the top of the game. I mean, we're speaking to a lot of people around here in St Helens and, and Warrington, where, where Luke's from. And they, they tell me that, you know, he's just a regular 16-year-old. He likes playing FIFA. He loves his darts. He loves his football. But under that, you know, under that boyish exterior is a very, very mature sportsman. The way he's conducted himself this week has been absolutely incredible. I mean, the interview is very mature as well. And we've seen 
you know, on the biggest stage, the nerves have not got to him yet. So everyone here in St Helens absolutely rooting for Luke. You can see his board here. He's got a very special board here at the Darts Academy. He's already a legend of St Helens, but uh, if he does the unthinkable tonight, it'll be one of the greatest sports stories probably this century, certainly since Leicester won the Premier League. And uh, he'll probably be celebrating with his favourite kebab. Guys, you, you enjoy kebabs? Yeah, yeah. I had one last night watching him. There we go. So Jack Flash had a kebab last night. If he wins, we'll all be down the kebab boss tonight later on. Cheers, Rosanna. Great report there from Nick Ellenby at the Darts Academy where Little are trained. I'm joined now in the studio by Martin Lipton, the Sun's chief sports reporter. We can't get enough. Uh, to be story. fair, I, I, I can't top that. I, I might as well give up and walk out the studio. <laughs> the crocodile did me in cold blood straight away. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an incredible story and it's, it's so charming. It's so British um, and I think it's just what we need at this time of year as well. But also he's so young, 16. It's almost inconceivably young for yeah. a, a sportsman to come into a sport like like darts, which has always been the realm of sort of people my age and, and older, and even people wider than me, which takes doing these days. Uh, and for him to look, you know, to be so innocent as he walks on, it's just it's a great good news story. And the fact that he's incredibly talented as well just add, adds to the the luster of the of the whole tale. It really does. I mean, in terms of um, the sport of darts, because it comes under some fire for not really being a sport. People are like, well, there's not much movement involved. You can do it in a pub. Is it a sport? I mean, what do you say to that? Well, look, it, it, it's taken darts from the sort of the heart of the pub to the heart of the public, hasn't it? In just a few weeks, it, 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 it seems. Anything that's got some degree of athleticism, some degree of physical action is, is a sport. Is pool a sport? Just about, yeah. Is darts a sport? Absolutely. It's not football, it's not cricket, it's an indoor game, but that doesn't mean it isn't a sporting contest and something of merit. You've got to be incredibly talented to do it because, you know, I try, I've got a dartboard at home, useless, utterly useless. <laughs> Can't, can ha barely hit the board, let alone hit treble 20. So for him to do it so regularly, averaging 100 in virtually every match he's played, beating two world champions to come to this stage, I mean, it's, it's, it's just incredible. Now, the way that the sport is growing, we're going to talk shortly to a sort of mar sports marketing expert about this, but it's gone from strength to strength. It's really grown. We talked about the prize money that's on offer, how much money this generates. Can you just see it going even bigger? And in terms of international, where does it sit there? Well, I mean, the, the way you go international is to crack the US, obviously. But, you know, people in the US play... Um, play darts. I remember I watched Ted Lasso and he was playing darts and pretended, <laughs> you know, the character of played darts in Kansas. So there are people in the States who play. But it is about that wider public recognition outside the, the, the hotbed of the game, which is obviously the UK, but also in continental Europe. There have been the odd uh, American, Canadian players. But if those start coming along and start to make a, a crack, it really would be, be big. But also, look, a story like this is crying out to be turned into a screenplay, hasn't it? It's a uh, it's a proper movie story to be written. Yeah. You can see it, and that would be another thing that would take it on to, to the next dimension as well. Well, you saw the way he's inspired those kids at that dance academy in the report we just watched. They call him the Nuke. They've all got nicknames and things like that. I mean, in terms of him, if he wins this, what could this turn into for him in terms of his notoriety as a, as a sportsman? Well, he'll become one of the faces of British sport straight mm. away. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable story in itself. You're... He, you know, in an Olympic year, would, it, would his achievement be transcended? Possibly, with England to win the Euros, maybe more important. But when it comes to breakthrough stars of, of the year, he'll be very much in there. And he, he's just starting. He's 16. He could do this for 30 years. That's a bit of a worrying concept, I mean. But he'd be, he could be doing it for an awful long time. He'll be able to go into the professional uh, tour that they have if he wants to, I think. I read some of a piece from saying, I, I might just calm it down a little bit. I don't want to get carried away. I don't want to be burnt out at 20 or whatever. Um, it does make me wonder as well, the psychology of these young teenagers, whether it's sort of not having lived very much that gives them the confidence to go up against Well, they're utterly titles. fearless. Yeah, that's they, it. They, they don't know what it, is to, what it feels like to lose. They're not scared of losing yeah. because they don't know what it's like to lose. You know, as you get older, you become more, more concerned about the ramifications and, and the impact of defeat. He's just having fun. He's doing what he loves. <laughs> he, he was playing darts on a magnetic ball from 18 months, playing on a proper ball from four years. It's just what he does for a bit of a laugh. Not start, first of all, with his mates and then on his own, and suddenly he's really good at it. And he, he doesn't care. He just wants to go out and play. And whatever happens tonight against Luke Humphries, who is world number one, who's pretty good, yeah. let's be honest, 
he's had an, a magic carpet ride. And, you know, I think everyone in the country is going to be t tuning in. Is going to want it to finish with the ultimate ultimate story with him throwing that last double to, to become world champion. Absolutely. You put it well, it's a good news story. Martin Lipton, chief reporter for Sports for the Sun. Thank you. Well, let's speak now a bit more about the business of this, the money involved. Nigel Curry, who is a PR and sponsorship consultant and the founder of sports marketing agency Brand Rapport. Thanks so much for making time for us. In terms of... Uh, the interest that has been sparked in the game, in the sport from this, I mean, no surprise really, because it's an extraordinary story, isn't it? Yeah, it's phenomenal. And if you look at every news channel tonight, there is a huge amount of coverage on Luke Littler and, and quite rightly so. Um, and that's exactly what darts needs. It, it, it's projected it into the national spotlight. And, uh, you know, it's such a bonus for the sport that doesn't get a lot of national coverage normally. So, you know, it darts is the winner as well as Luke Littler. Now, I saw some uh, commentary online today that perhaps uh, Luke's agent, I'm not directing this at that person specifically, but some people were saying, are they looking after him enough because he's 16 and he's been thrown into the spotlight like this and he's doing so much kind of, he has mascots running up to him and there's people and he's signing things, you know. What does it take to manage a young person like this when they're going through something like this? Well, it takes a lot and it, it's all happened very quickly, so they'll need to react as quickly to th this new sort of media um, spotlight and all the fame and all the attention. But he'll have good people around him and he'll be, be, be well directed. And, and once the, the dust settles after tonight, uh, win or lose, he'll, um, he'll be well looked after and well groomed to, to sort of keep going and, and uh, perform even better in front of the cameras. He's done very well so far anyway. He has done incredibly well. A lot of the success of the sport in the last few years has been credited to a man called um, Barry Hearn. Talk to us a little bit about what he's managed to do for it. Uh, Barry Hearn's a, a genius at, at taking sports and, and, and turning them into getting the maximum amount of them. If, if you think of darts, it's not a, a complicated sport. And, as, you know, it, it, you could out argue it's limited interest, just a bloke throwing three darts at a, a dartboard. So Barry turned it into an entertainment. You, you've got these massive crowds now. They all dress up as whatever. My son used to come and dress up as an Oompa Loompa. It was the only <laughs> night of the year we ever knew where he was, my wife and I. We could see him on the telly. It's The crowds love it. Um, it, it just makes the whole event. It's fantastic for, for, the, for the players, the enthusiasm, the singing. And it's just turned it into an entertainment rather than just a sport. And it's a huge money spinner as well. We've talked about the prize money that has increased over the years. It's somewhere around a half a million now. I mean, how, yeah. how does that compare to other sports? And is it an enticement for people to try it? Oh, it's, it's, it's right up there now. It's right up there. I remember, you know, 20 odd years ago when the Breakaway Darts League started, the, the total prize money for the event was 50,000. Now, the, 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 we'll, we'll get 200,000 minimum. You might get half a million. It's huge money and huge rewards for the players because that's just one tournament. There's 10 different tournaments at least throughout the year, plus the, the Premier League, which you'll, Luke Littler will, will no doubt be, be looking to get into. And, you know, appearance fees, sponsorship money, it all, all add up. He'll become a, a very rich man on the back of this and, and the money in darts generally will, will go through the roof because of it. What a lovely thing. Look, Nigel Curry, PR and uh, sports sponsorship consultant, thanks so much for joining us. Next, here on Primetime, could splits along the right of the political spectrum leave Sakir Starmer with an open goal at the general election? We'll be discussing that next. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm off calm. I'm Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back, you're watching Prime Time with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Now, could a right-wing row be what actually ushers in a Labour government this year and unleashes what some on the right today have branded Starmageddon? Now, the ultimate nightmare for the Conservatives at the upcoming general election is a squeeze from both left and right, removing any chance they have of capitalising on Labour weakness. And right on cue, the Lib Dems today with an enormous stunt they're promoting a Tory removals service and the so-called blue wall of southern Tory seats. As I said, David, looking very happy with himself there. The real threat's actually coming from the right, though, where the Reform Party is putting on the pressure and clearly enjoying it. The truth is, the Tories are terrified. Yes, in the new year, the special pleading has already started. Oh, please don't stand here. Please don't stand there. I'm one of the nice guys. I believe in all everything that you believe in. You've all broken Britain. You're all responsible. So there's no special deals. We stand in every single seat. Richard Tyser, leader of Reform, speaking. And Reform say they could cost the Tories victory in countless seats, though today's event was lacking one big name in the shape of ex-leader Nigel Farage. And while they say they're turning their fire on Labour too, the opposition's lead is currently holding firm. For more, let's speak to Spectator's political correspondent, James Hill. James, good to see you again. Happy see New you. Year. Happy New Year, Zana. Um, Let's talk then about the threat that reform really poses. I mean, do you think the Conservatives are nervous? I think you saw an extent of that kind of nerves with the reaction from the media today and about 50 journalists turning out today because the two big questions everyone in Westminster is asking is, first of all, when's the election going to be? And second of all, will Nigel Farage come back? Mm. And I think there'll be some Tory MPs today who are a bit relieved that Farage is not coming back just yet. I think there certainly is a threat from the Reform Party. Uh, if you look at what they're polling in the polls, they got 10% or so. That would translate into around 35 seats lost for the Tories, according to polling. Um, but the key question is, can they actually deliver on that? And so right now, reform is more of a theoretical threat rather than an actuality, because you look at the by-elections, for instance, they haven't had what UKIP had, which was a successful ground game. The key thing is, today was all about, actually, rather than Nigel Farage's comeback, it was actually about announcing the candidate for that forthcoming Wellingborough by-election. And th that will be a key by-election contest. And the other one will be Blackpool South. If they can do well on those two, and perhaps actually put up sort of five, ten percent, and translating those polls into reality, then there'll be much more of a threat. Right now, it's a little bit wait and see, and actually, when of course the election will be called.
No, there was some really not so subtle open public flirting almost with yeah. the idea of Nigel Farage coming back. Um, uh, why hasn't he public? Because he does still sort of contribute to the party from the background, but why isn't he in the foreground? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, talking to some people who've known Farage a long time, they say, look, it, it won't be a kind of planned stunt, you know, a, sort of a 9 a.m. Wednesday press conference. It's actually going to be a moment when he's alone, he thinks, I've got a public, you know, there's a duty to do this. And when he chooses the moment he wants to come back and strike, it's probably the optimal yeah. moment. And I have to say, yes, at the yes, moment, yes. there's so little uncertainty, there's so little knowledge about when the time is going to be. It could even be a year away again, uh, the election. So I think Farage will probably want to wait till the optimum moment. Um, and then in the short campaign, say 10 weeks out for an election, play much more of a role. Because, of course, also he's got his TV show and um, he won't, can't be able to do that and be a candidate at the same time. Uh, yep, no, we'll have to wait and see for that one. Look, James, thank you very much. Also, after today's posters and pledges from the third parties, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer will look to make the political weather themselves tomorrow. The Labour leader, Starmer, said to highlight the collapse in public trust in politics and promising a tougher approach to those who defraud the government. And after a claimed Tory triumph and asylum numbers turned into an argument about honesty in politics, what can Prime Minister Rishi Sunak do to seize back the agenda? Joining me now, Conservative MP for Don Valley, Nick Fletcher. Nick, thanks for making time. I mean, um, first of all, what do you want to hear from Prime Minister Sunak tomorrow? I want him to uh, continue on the path that he is at the moment in getting to start the boats. I think that's hugely important. We need to uh, and be more conservative and I think and we've obviously had a time due to, due to COVID where we've had to help an awful lot of people out, which we have done. But uh, I think it's now time to be more conservative, reduce the state and uh, put the power back in the people's hands with personal responsibility and uh, take control of our borders. That's what I was sent down to Westminster to do more than anything else. I came in on the uh, let's get Brexit done and uh, that's what the people want to see. And we're doing everything that we can and I know people expect more, but it is extremely difficult to do. But uh, we're heading in the right direction. We've gone through two or three years of, of real um, difficult times and I think the last thing that we all need now is a Labour government to come in because that would uh, send this country into turmoil. Well, we can bet that what we hear from Keir Starmer tomorrow is uh, picking apart at the five-point plan that Rishi Sunak launched just this time last year in which he has failed to deliver on many points, something that Richard Tice, leader of reform, brought up in his speech today. Look, Tice also saying that Conservatives have broken the country, it says your fellow MPs like Lee Anderson are terrified he'll put them out of a job. What's your response to him? No, I don't think we've broken the country at all. As I say, I think it's extremely difficult. Uh, we've gone through a really difficult time. But the boats is definitely being reduced. The uh, inflation is hard, which we promised. And obviously, once we can get um, the debt down as well, which hopefully we will do over the next six to 12 months, moving forward with conservative policies, then uh, we're obviously heading in, into a really good position. I'm hoping we're going to see some tax cuts in March put some money back into people's pockets again and really start getting the country moving forward. People tend to forget that we didn't have two years with COVID, which was an awful time for everybody. But the government went in and paid everybody's wages through that time, which was a really, really important thing for them to do. And then the minute we came out of COVID restrictions, then we found Putin and invaded Ukraine, which put the price of energy up. So we've had a difficult time. I don't deal in excuses, I deal in facts. This is what has happened. We are now... We're starting to see the green roots, uh, the green uh, flashes coming through, and we will eventually, uh, over this next six to 12 months, start seeing some real progress on the economy, money in people's pockets, and obviously get these boats stopped altogether. Yeah, if you've got enough time left to do that before an election, of course. I mean, look, Nick, can I ask you just plainly, can you see the lure of reform for certain Conservative voters right now? I can always see that. And it's easy to, to say these things, which uh, Richard Tice did today, when he's not in government. They've never been in government. They don't know what it's like in government. And unfortunately, if anybody votes for reform, that's one sure way of getting Labour. And if there's one thing that Richard Tice and I both agree on, that will be the worst thing for this country. I have lived under a Labour uh, government, under a la local, label go local government, for the last 50 years, and it's been atrocious. And I'm the first Conservative member of Parliament for five decades who was actually holding my Labour uh, council 
to account. They don't like it, but the people of Doncaster do. And I need to make sure that people vote Conservative because, one, it's the only way they're going to keep me in a job. And I do believe that the local people love having a local member of parliament who is actually really doing his best to make this area as good as it can be. And also, if they vote uh, for Conservative in the other seats in there, then we can remove people like Ed Miliband, who've been sat in these seats for a long, long time. We need to remove those. But unfortunately, if people vote for, re for reform, they will get Labour. And all the hard work that I've done locally over the last four years will be lost. Uh, talking about the hard work locally, you've got a majority of uh, 3,600. Are you worried about your seat? I'm always worried about my seat, which is why I continue, uh, continually work as hard as I can. I'm out day in, day out, doing everything that I can for my constituents, banging the drum and holding this council of ours, this Labour council of ours that's turned Doncaster into the place that nobody likes anymore. That is what my job is. I want to get Doncaster back on its feet again, Doncaster moving again. And the only way that will happen is if people vote Conservative. If they vote Reform, they vote Green, they vote Labour, that they will only end up with Labour again for another five decades. And that will be the worst thing for Doncaster and the worst thing for our country. We need to vote Conservative. We need to be more Conservative. And we need tax cuts. We need to stop the boats. We know what we need to do. We've had three years of difficult times. But the next year, and hopefully the next four years after that, we can really turn this country around. And I know that's what Richard Tice wants. I know that's what I want. And I know that's what the people who voted for me want. But the only way to make sure that that happens is voting Conservative. Nick Fletcher MP, thanks so much for joining us. Thank well, you. Well, next here on Primetime, could a deadly double bombing in, the, in Iran ignite the Middle East's tinderbox? We'll bring you the latest. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that.
This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Iran now for our next story. A double bombing at a memorial service for a top general has left the country reeling, killing at least 103 people and wounding at least another 200 and <laughs> Now, Iran has labelled the attack on a parade in the city of Kerman terrorism, vowing to track down those responsible, saying two explosive devices were placed along a route to a cemetery, then detonated remotely. The regime has yet to officially blame any country or group for the blasts, and none have so far claimed official responsibility. Some local officials have blamed Israel, thought to have been behind a blast targeting Hamas members in Lebanon yesterday. For more on this, I'm joined by the former UK ambassador to Iran, Sir Richard Dalton. Sir, thank you. Um, I think the question a lot of people will be asking is, who could this have been if it was terror? Uh, it was terror, and there's a number of candidates. One would be uh, domestic oppositionists, those who claim to speak for the Sunni Muslim majority in southeastern Iran. Uh, another candidate uh, would be uh, Israel. Uh, Israel's conduct in Gaza shows that they're motivated by three things, punishment, revenge, and deterrence. Uh, they welcome inflicting large-scale civilian casualties as part of their campaign, although they deny that. And the supreme leader of Iran praised the appalling terrorist attack of the 7th of October, and it would be characteristic of Iran, of, of, of Israel, to wish to take revenge and to send a strong political signal to Iran that if they support the killing of Israeli civilians, they will lose civilians themselves. And Israel has a history of state terrorist activity in Iran, uh, targeting nuclear scientists, uh, for example. Another candidate, of course, is Islamic State. Uh, they have undertaken terrorist actions uh, inside Iran. Uh, it's hard to be sure at this stage, mm. but uh, we should keep all three as possibilities. And I believe that the most likely in the limited amount of information we have at present is Israel. Now, the US has said it has no indication that it was Israel, but as you say, we should wait until there is further detail and information available. But of course, this is happening at the time of the, uh, you know, conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Uh, but it is also a separate occasion that was happening. The memorial four years of the assassination by the US of yeah, General Qasem Soleimani, uh, which at the time, I remember, was thought to, it might cause ripples, it might cause, you know, a serious war. Then the pandemic happened. We find ourselves here. There's a conflation of issues happening all at the same time, but it was certainly no accident it was his memorial, was it? Uh, no, uh, because Qasem Soleimani was the architect of Iran's relationships with groups fighting for influence and power in Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Palestine. Uh, many nations are, of course, involved across their borders inside this volatile and unpredictable part of the Middle East, uh, and Iran is amongst them. Uh, they use their so-called axis of resistance as a form of deterrence against the frequent threats of aggression against them by the United States uh, and Israel. Uh, the coincidence of this attack with the attack in Beirut, of course, adds to the tension in the region. But the signs are present that both Hezbollah and Iran don't wish to use these attacks as an excuse or as the starting gun for a regional war. They appear to assess that they would lose more than they gain were they to attack Israel. And we all uh, obviously don't want to see further contagion throughout the region. Look, uh, Sir Richard Dalton, it's been um, a pleasure to get your insights this evening. Thank you for making time. Thank you.
Well, back here in the UK now, uh, some very so different kind of news. Unwelcome news, people who use eBay, Etsy and Vinted to sell secondhand clothing. Sellers making more than a thousand quid a year online marketplaces will now need to register as self-employed for tax return purposes under new laws. This comes as 16% of respondents to a survey say they've taken on a side hustle to help pay for cost of living increases. More on this, I'm joined in the studio by a money expert for which, Harry Kine. Good to see you, Harry. Thanks for coming in. Look, I mean, uh, let's talk about this. It's uh, January, a lot of people are filing tax returns at the yes. moment, and now they're dumping this on people who are trying to make a side hustle. <laughs> well, the good news is there's no actual change in what tax you might have to pay, who will be paying any tax. What this really is, is a change in, it's essentially an international snitching law. Okay. Previously, HMRC could ask places like eBay, Vinted, Airbnb, for example, can we have information about who's been selling products, listing things on these sites? And most of the time they said, yeah, sure, have it. With this great big new change in the law, these international companies will provide that information as a massive great big fire hose of data to HMRC so that they can see people who are breaking the rules. And actually, the rules are pretty generous. You have that £1,000 tax-free allowance for side hustles. But also, if you are selling your old clothes and they're things that you've bought, you've bought for your children and you no longer want, an old TV, old furniture, you can sell that tax-free up to £6,000 per item. No problem there whatsoever. The HMRC is very good at encouraging people to sell their old tax, basically. Really good for the environment and you won't be taxed on that. Uh, okay, that's that's good news. Yes. Uh, I got to say, and I saw that the boss of Vinted, mm. which of course is a secondhand clothing company, I use it a lot. It's great to buy and to sell. He sort of said, well, not many people on our platform are actually going to trigger this thousand pound threshold. But I spoke to some friends today who do side hustle mm. selling on eBay and Vinted, and they're quite worried. They said, actually, I do trigger a thousand a year. Yes, and so those people, they should be putting in self-assessment tax returns already. Uh -oh. And if they haven't been, mm -hmm. then they'll probably be caught out by this. I've been kind of hanging around on a few eBay forums today, and I've found a lot of sellers are basically saying, this is great news, because there are people who will buy a shipping container full of you know, old dresses and try and sell those, making a fortune in profit, and they are not getting taxed. And they won't be able to get away with that anymore. Whereas people who are selling, you know, £2,000 of stuff a year, people like myself, I do a bit of tutoring on the side. That's my side hustle. When I make more than £1,000, I have a self-assessment tax return. People like us, we pay our taxes, we'll carry on just the same as normal, and it will just make it easier for HMRC to catch people out. What do you tutor, Harry? <laughs> oh, anything. As long as I can do the week before what the person is learning, then I can tutor <laughs> anything. I just got to read a chapter ahead. As long as you can cram it. Look, we can understand why people do side hustles mm. in the cost of living crisis, can't we? Um, it's quite a smart way of getting by. It is. It is. It's a 70 billion pound industry for the UK. And it is where a, a whole load of entrepreneurs start out. They, they have a hobby. They make a little bit of money from it. Eventually, they hit that 1,000 pound threshold, they have to declare it, chances are they might not have to pay tax on that if they are below the personal threshold. But eventually you get into that system, you put in all of your data, you get a bit of tax, but for a few people it becomes their whole job. Mm -hmm. And I know people who've gone on to great success from something that was just a way of earning a bit of extra cash, as half of young people do, and now that's their whole job. They're self-employed, they are the entrepreneurs of the future. That's how people get into business now. And, yeah, business taxes would apply. Normally, look, Harry Kind, who appreciate you coming in. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Next here on Primetime, the panel's going to be here in the studio. We're going to go over some other headlines from the day, including an apparent fire sale, maybe a bit of a side hustle to raise cash by Baroness Michelle Moe. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. You're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. <laughs> the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your this ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. Time now for our panel to dissect some other headlines that caught our eye on this hump day in January. Joining me in the studio, journalist and commentator Andrew Connolly and assistant US opinion editor at The Telegraph joins us, Poppy Coburn. Great to see you both. Thanks so much. Look, first tonight, reports have revealed that scandal hit Tory peer Michelle Moan and her husband Doug Barrowman. They're having an £80 million fire sale of their luxury Caribbean villa private jet and super yacht. This comes after a report from non-governmental organisation Tax Policy Associates was delayed. Its founder, Dan Needle, saying, quote, we thought this story would be recapping the fairly well-known Barrowman contractor loan tax avoidance scheme. And we've actually found something much more serious and evidence we think should lead to a prosecution. So there's a lot going on, of course, uh, under fire at most, of course, for the PPE MegPro links, which they first denied and have now accepted that they're a part of, then saying, oh, but we only lied to the journalists. Uh, and now this going on, uh, we're going back to get some revelations about Doug Barrowman and they're selling all their stuff. I mean, is the net closing in, Andrew? I mean, I'm also fascinated to know which PR people they've hired um, that seem to be convincing them that they're likeable people whose, <laughs> whose plight the public will really sympathise with. But actually, I don't think it's really relatable uh, to have pocketed tens of millions of pounds in a national emergency and then given a very sullen sort of woe is me interview about it all, where, as you say, um, Moan said that it wasn't a crime to lie to the press, but why isn't it actually a crime what she did? Mm -hmm. She denied uh, things using some terrifying legal letters sent to journalists, basically muzzling the press, of allegations that now have turned out to be true. Why can't we tighten up the libel laws in this country so that people uh, can't use the law in that way? This was also someone sitting in the legislature which is also originally perhaps a question for Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton, uh, under whose tenure she was put into the House of Lords. Uh, it's a question for former leader Boris Johnson and his officials who were presiding over this quite sort of opaque VIP lane in which people could just jump on a call and bid for these contracts, despite also, mm. again, I point to being in the legislature and indeed the man who is signing off all these cheques Mr Rishi Sunak. So um, Labour 
really should have a field day with this politically, and I gather Starmer's mm. uh, making a speech tomorrow on, um, you know, what could be a re something that this country really lacks, which would be a commitment to more transparency and also well-resourced, well-funded, anti-graft, anti-corruption law enforcement. Labour are set to say they're going to crack down on cronyism, as you say. Uh, one of their defences they've used in this PR blitz, uh, Poppy, um, Michelle and her husband, is that they're being made scapegoats for a lot of what was happening with well, PPE. I mean, look, you know, Michelle and her husband, uh, uh, you know, as you have said, Andrews, that they're not sympathetic people. Um, the way they've come across in the last couple of weeks is, you know, that they seem to be deeply unpleasant. You wouldn't want to have to have a conversation with them, let alone work with them. But that said, she is kind of correct. Like, uh, scapegoating is pretty loaded language, but we can't lose sight of the fact this isn't just a story about the media. This is a story about what the government did in a time of national or well, international crisis, who they relied on. I mean, so obviously a scam operation from the very beginning. And this isn't the only instance of dodgy contracting that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. I would say, let's broaden this out. Let's not just focus on these two clowns, because they are clowns. They're clownish people. They're very tacky. I mean, the, the whole gigantic super yacht, the Lady M, I mean, it's ridiculous. Let's focus on the fact why was the government even dealing with these people in the first place? And I think that's what we shouldn't lose sight of. This is a political corruption story, not just a kind of sideshow. Look, both of you are clearly in the Michelle Moan fan club. <laughs> I get that. Uh, and, uh, but some interesting points made there about what we could get from Labour, but also about just, yeah, wider corruption that was happening at the time. I hear your point, Bobby. Look, we, we've got some other stories we want to cross with you, which is this. It's the time of year where people look to lay off the booze. Dry January, a lot of people try that now. But a new poll from YouGov has revealed that 18 to 24-year-olds as a whole are turning down booze generally. More than half now are going for low or non-alcoholic drinks. So is this the beginning of the end for boozy Britain? I mean, we've been talking about this for some time, Andrew. Gen Z just don't seem to have the appetite for alcohol that some of us elder millennials and above do. I mean, I just think January is the time you need a drink the most. <laughs> and I also think that the nation's pubs are on their knees and I resolve to give them all the support that they need. You're charitable in this, like in this that. critical yeah, time. But yeah. sure, I mean, um, people should be. I, I also think about dry January, at least based on the people that I know who do it, it, it seems to give them carte blanche to drink copious amounts the other 11 months of the year. But I really think people should be encouraged if they do want to cut down. We are a nation of functioning alcoholics at we the are. end of the day, so good for the kids. Uh, I wonder what they do instead. Um, I would also suggest, actually, that we need to change maybe licensing in this country to give people places to go who aren't drinking or who don't drink, because we're sat here in the capital city in London right now, and you'd be quite hard-pressed to even get a coffee or a soft drink or whatever mm. after 5 p.m. I mean, you know, if you don't want to go to a pub. So I think we also need to broaden out people's options and, and change the, if people are indeed going down that road of no drinking. That's a, that's a good point. And I, I am conscious, Poppy, especially with my younger colleagues and, and friends, you know, that we shouldn't foist, you know, after work drinking on them because attitudes are changing. I mean, look, I don't know about you. I actually am Gen Z. And I, every single year, for I think the last four or so years, I've said, I'm going to do dry January. This is the time. Like, I'm going to do a fresh start. I'm going to get really healthy. I'm going to go to the gym. I had a new record this year. I had my first alcoholic drink, I think at 1 p.m. on New Year's Day. I had a Bloody Mary because <laughs> I was dealing with such a horrible hangover. So it, it was even more unsuccessful than the last couple of attempts I've done. I do wonder sometimes if, you know, uh, who are they polling on this? Because none of my friends I know do it. I would never look down on someone who did it. I think it's a brilliant thing if you, if you can manage to get through it. But, you know, I, I wonder if this kind of wellness health kick fad is just that, it's a bit of a fad. And maybe people are actually moving the other way. Because when I, when I was at university, this was all the rage. Everybody was giving up drinking, everyone was going down the gym, everybody was doing G-Sing. And it does now feel like everybody's starting to now move away from that kind of Instagram health culture. So I hope, you know, that I've been sticking to my plans of, of drinking as much as possible, um, that society will finally catch up with what I've been doing. So uh, fingers crossed for next year. That even in and of itself, I find quite surprising that at university, you had people who were doing juicing and I'm working serious. out and it was stopping horrendous. drinking. It was really scary. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary to me. And I don't know, was that representative of your time at university? Certainly not. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm... 
I would need a million dry Januaries to get over what I did at university, which was to enjoy what seems like a relatively cheap time to go to the pub, because I'm pretty sure I was there every day, lunchtime and evening, whereas now, I mean, you know, you need to be earning quite a bit to be able yeah. to even afford to drink. Oh, goodness, pints. The price of a pint right now is extraordinary. And probably it makes me wonder if we do have a generation of non-boozers whether we're going to have to do something to encourage people to go into pubs. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise, you know, it is a big part of uh, the United Kingdom and our culture, as Andrew pointed out, that is all about drinking. I came back from living overseas for seven years and I did think we are somewhat functioning alcoholics <laughs> here. There is a big centre around booze here, but this recent polling, of course, showing that younger generations... Perhaps not so much, not your friends, Poppy, but uh, the people who answer this YouGov poll, uh, certainly. Look, coming up next, Piers Morgan Uncensored, Douglas Murray is standing in for him. What's coming up on the show tonight, Douglas? Thanks very much, Rosanna. Uh, tonight, we're debating whether the new UK women's champion to the UN being a biologically born male is as bad an idea as it sounds. And I'll be joined by the massively popular Chris Williamson, host of the Modern Wisdom podcast to talk New Year, New You nonsense. I'll also be on the Oki, as I think they call it in darts, at eight. Well, thanks very much, Douglas. That's all we have time for tonight here on Prime. So I want to thank my panel, Poppy and Andrew, here in the studio. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. When a big bearded member of Hizbut Tahir calls for jihad on the streets of London, they are not calling for an inner personal struggle with the divine. If you're not tolerant, go die in a trench. It makes King Lee is not very bright. I only read his books because I'm paid to. I was out as gay when you were still talking about whether or not you were. Sorry, love, you're not a celebrity, you're just gay. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about.